How you doing today? <laughs> so this is the why. In the spring, I teach a class at Columbia Seminary called Back to the Text. The idea is simple. I pick a book of scripture. The students read all the scholarly literature about it that we can digest. And every Monday night, we gather to read through the entire book together. At the end of the semester, we perform it for the seminary community and anyone else who wants to come. We've done the Gospel of Mark and the Book of Esther. And this spring, we are going to do First and Second Timothy. And I am so looking forward to hearing someone tell me I have to be quiet in church. <laughs> Back to the text has become my favorite class which is a little weird because there isn't any preaching in the course, <laughs> and officially that is what I teach. But I love this class because of what it does to us as a reading community. By the end of the semester, when we perform the entire book, we are fiercely in love with it. It is inside us, we are carrying it everywhere. We don't memorize it, that isn't the goal. But we make interpretive choices together about how we want to stage it because we have read it so many times by then. During the first six weeks of the class, I plan a different contextual scenario for us for each reading. We read it sitting around a table, verse by verse. We read it while improv improvising the action. We read it in masks. We read it imagining we're an underground community of persecuted believers who could be killed for possessing the book itself. We read it while roaming around the campus. That's fun for the librarians. And we read it with women taking men's parts and men taking women's parts. We've dressed up, we've dressed down, done it with choreography, done it in drag. Every reading shows us something new. And over the semester, we learn how rich it is to read scripture as a repertory church, with the freedom to rehearse it and experiment with it and fall in love with it. Well, last spring, we were working on the Book of Esther. And the Festival of Purim took place in the first week of March, right in the middle of the semester. It seemed logical that we would attend services since Purim is the festival that celebrates Esther. So I called around to various synagogues to see if we could come. A conservative ne synagogue nearby was especially friendly on the phone, so off we went on a Wednesday night. A wide-eyed group of mostly young, mostly Southern seminarians, all denominations, all races, all of whom had studied biblical Hebrew, none of whom had ever been to a synagogue. We kind of stood out. <laughs> but you would never know it, given the warm reception that we received. You would think Protestant seminarians who like to read Esther show up at their congregation every week. Maybe they do. The rabbis welcomed us. They introduced us around. They told us to make ourselves at home. We joined a potluck dinner in process. The children were having a costume parade. The youth group was selling boxes of macaroni and cheese to use as noisemakers. And just as the sun went down, we all filed into the sanctuary for worship. So picture this. Up front is the rabbi in his Yankees baseball cap pouring shots, as well as little glasses of margaritas and mojitos, while he simultaneously chants the scroll in Hebrew. The associate rabbi, resplendent in her costume of silk veils, is organizing a Twitter feed on a screen up front, which was a first for this congregation. She is inviting members to chime in with their cell phones, which they are, when they aren't encouraging their children to make more noise with the macaroni boxes. Four members stood up to take their turns reading and chanting the scroll in Hebrew, a woman behind us whispered to tell us that they had been studying with the rabbis for months in preparation because the melodies used to chant the Book of Esther are especially intricate and difficult to learn. So the story that our class knew so well unfolded in Hebrew 
And as it did, the congregation sort of went wild. We sang, we stomped, we twittered, we drank, we yelled whenever Haman's name was mentioned. We made jokes about the rabbi on the Twitter feed. He roared with laughter. Children ran up and down the aisles. Teenagers texted without getting in trouble. Parents made a second trip to the drinks table. And after an hour of the, all this, we trooped out of the sanctuary and ate hamantaschen, which is the traditional Purim cookie. By the time we left, the entire congregation was waving goodbye and inviting us to come back anytime. We were always welcome at their conservative synagogue, especially a group with such knowledge of scripture. My students were slack-jawed. Okay, so we were performing the text every Monday night in class, but this was real. This was a real congregation drinking real margaritas during real worship, and the rabbi was working the blender and reading the text in Hebrew while wearing a Yankees hat in Atlanta, and no one was acting like there was anything unusual about this. In fact, they all looked completely calm, as if breaking every single rule they have about worship was not freaking them out in the slightest. Next week, they would be back to normal. No margaritas, no baseball caps, no macaroni boxes, no texting, twittering jokes about the rabbi in the sanctuary until Purim came around next year. I mean, it was surreal for my students. They knew that the Book of Esther is about parody and rehearsal and reversal. It's about reversal. They just did not know what it would be to enact that with a congregation. To push the limits of what is acceptable for one night. To make fun of the rabbi and ourselves. To do sacrilegious things in the sanctuary. And not just for the heck of it, not just because it's Youth Sunday and now we're all going to toss beach balls around the, around the sanctuary to remind us about God's buoyant Holy Spirit. <laughs> no, this pushing of the limits is what we do. This is what we do when we read a story about a genocide that almost happened and didn't. This pushing of the limits is what we do when we read the book of Esther. Not Jeremiah, not Ezekiel, not Amos, which might make more sense, Esther, which is about a Jewish woman who becomes queen of Persia by hiding who she is. Her very name means I am hiding. And who finally stages a coming out party for the king in order to tell him, her husband, that she is a Jew and if he goes through with this edict to kill every Jew in Persia, he's going to have to kill her too. My students knew all this. But rehearsing the book of Esther with this congregation tossed them into the deep end of the pool after a lot of practicing their strokes in the air poolside. <laughs> now they were asking things like, why are issues of identity so often at the root of acts of violence. Does hiding who we are perpetuate or allow violence against others to continue? And is it really necessary to return to these questions every year in this way? Why does profaning the sacred help us to remember what is sacred? I can tell you, our conversation in class got a lot more interesting after our trip to the synagogue. Our weekly readings weren't just for the sake of play, which I'm pretty sure was the motivation for some of my students when they signed up for the class. Now, it was for the sake of justice. It mattered. There were real issues, real lives at stake, and we were making connections between who we were, our constructed identities, and the acts of violence all around us in this world. We were thinking about the power of coming out 
in whatever form that verb takes for you and for us and how it really does overturn the powers of this world. You want to know the why of all the repertory church rehearsal, this script in the scripture, this text of terror reading stuff? There it is. Because out of the blue, in the middle of a margarita in worship, it hits you. This is not about me. This is not about us. It's not even about our wild group with our wolf suits, although that's fun. It isn't even about something called finding the most brilliant interpretation of them all. This is about justice for the oppressed. This is about liberation for the captives. This is about the realm of God breaking its way in, and we just saw a flash of its truth right there. So let's follow that, because Lord, I want to be in that number. I want to be in that number when the redeemed and liberated saints go marching in. I wish I could tell you how that moment of epiphany happens. I can't. But I can tell you that it's why my students and I read verbs like crazy people, why we read scripture feet first, why we read as a repertory church. When the liberated and redeemed saints of God go marching in, we want to be in that number. So there are two things I want to offer you with the time that we have left. The first is a little scholarship. I want to tell you about one theorist who's done seminal work in the field of performance studies and who helps my students and I to get our bearings in the middle of rehearsal when things go nuts. The second thing I want to offer is another abbreviated reading of a biblical text. It's from the eighth chapter of John. And this is the text that shows me what the why looks like when Jesus gets involved. It reminds me of why I, why I stay in the scene and stay in the church and stay in the Christian faith, or maybe why it stays in me. So, the theory. Richard Schechner, who teaches at the Tisch School of the Arts in New York City, wild man who practically invented the field of performance studies himself, he has written that every performance, no matter what it is, and he uses that term very loosely. Every performance has four aspects. And as I said, my students and I have learned to hold these very close to hand as they help us to keep calm and carry on without freaking out when a reading gets wild. So the first aspect of performance, according to Schechner, is that it is subjunctive. It deals in the as-if tense. Which lets us ask, what would happen if we did this or did that or rehearsed the text as if we were teenagers or soldiers or girls in Afghanistan on a school bus or living with a terminal illness? The subjunctive allows us to rehearse different possibilities in freedom yet with precision. And that's what we try to do every week in the class, back to the text. We keep changing the variables to see what will transpire. The second aspect of performance is that it is liminal. That's a seminary favorite word these days. Did you use that when you, those of you here for your 50th, 50th reunion? Was it used like every other word in class? I feel like that's the theological word of the moment. Performance is liminal. It plays at the edges. It works the angles. It pushes the limits of what is possible. It takes us past the margins of what might be acceptable or thinkable or believable or possible. So for example, take our trip to the synagogue. When we walked into that sanctuary and the rabbi offered us drinks, a few of my students had to really check themselves they are pious Baptists. They don't drink, really, they don't. And the in worship part of this equation was blowing their minds. They had to be very stern with themselves and remember the liminal nature of performance so that they could physically stay put and not run out of the synagogue. 
It was a big move for them, and I was proud they did it. But they could never have done it if they had not framed this as a rehearsal in liminal space. The third aspect of performance is that it is duplicitous. What is happening on the stage isn't reality as we know it. It's just so real. It's more truthful than we are. And so it resonates deep down. It opens doors that we thought we had locked tight. It shows us who we really are, or could be. Not all the time, not at every moment of the performance, but in flashes, in fragments. Often enough for us to need to keep reminding ourselves that what's taking place on the stage up there is not reality as we know it, it's just so real. So for example, a character in a play murders another character. We know the actors are using fake swords, at least we hope they are. We did not buy a ticket to see a real murder, which would make us witnesses or even accomplices in real life. We expect that what is happening on that stage isn't really real. So why does it seem to hold so much more truth than everyday life? Because performance shows us a duplicitous kind of truth. Not real, yet more real than the world we know and the reality we consent to live. And the fourth aspect of performance for Schechner is that it is dangerous. Stuff happens. Stuff changes. I mean, real stuff, real lives, and in ways that are completely disruptive. A lighter version of this is the tendency for leading actors and actresses who play opposite one another to actually fall in love off stage. It happens a lot. It's very romantic. <laughs> and when you are no longer a teenager, it's very dangerous. You cannot sustain a relationship on stage with a mirage and then go home. A heavier version of this is what happens in the book of Esther when Esther weighs the risk of revealing her Jewish identity or continuing to hide it. Coming out is dangerous for her. She could be killed. Not coming out is dangerous for her people. They will be killed. So she conceives a performance before the king whose outcome she can't predict. She can only hope that his eyes will be opened and he will see and hear and stop the violence. It happens to work, but she didn't know that going in. Performance can be dangerous for us, literally, and it can have dangerous consequences for a people or a system or a world as we know it. Repertory companies have always known this. Bertolt Brecht's Theater of Berlin produced new plays that contained searing critiques of the political situation in Germany during the wars with very little attempt to hide or disguise the message. Jerzy Grotowski's poor theater challenged the motives and the excesses of contemporary theater by stripping a play down to its bare bones. No lights, no costumes, no stage, sometimes even no audience. Augusto Boal's Theater of the Oppressed traveled from village to village in Brazil, inviting audience members to join the performance in progress, imagining alternative endings for situations of oppression that they were living, and then inviting them to act it out. These repertory companies knew that what they did was subjunctive and liminal and what are the other two? I lost my place. Duplicitous and dangerous. And that they were going to upset people and critics and governments, which they did, oh yeah. And to be honest, they kind of welcomed it for them. The whole point, the whole point of theater was that it ought to be a vehicle for political and artistic and social change. And they were very serious about it. 
and very impatient about the pace of change, and they didn't always have a sense of humor when it came to waiting or even discussing their work with outsiders, and you could argue that it was almost impossible for anyone to live up to their ideals, which is why we study them and admire them without necessarily trying to recreate them. There are some newer repertory companies today that have gone in the other direction entirely by vowing to never take themselves seriously. One of my favorites is Improv Everywhere, the New York City-based prank collective. If you don't know it, go on, go on the internet and find it. Improv Everywhere. Their mission as, they, as their founder, Charlie Todd, who was, I think, a theater major at Duke and a frustrated actor, that's why he started this whole thing, their mission is to create scenes of chaos and joy in public places. So Improv Everywhere is famous for events like the annual No Pants Subway Ride <laughs> and the Black Tie Beach Day at Coney Island. But while Brecht and Grotowski and Boal were deliberately confrontational, unapologetically grand in their aims, Improv Everywhere seems content to give New Yorkers a shared moment and a story to tell when they go home about how hilarious it was to ride the subway this morning with 300 people who apparently forgot to put on their pants. <laughs> the purpose is to laugh as a community, and that is a good and necessary thing, especially in a place that is as grim as a subway during the morning commute. And it points us towards something that I think Brecht and Grotowski and Boal sometimes forgot in their quest for truth, which is the role of the trickster. My husband David reminded me that most religions have a trickster in their pantheon of gods. And it's the trickster's role to mix it up, stir the pot, make a little mischief, engage in some monkey business so the humans don't get too full of themselves, or maybe God either. The trickster is also a source of truth. Or maybe it would be more accurate to say a flasher of truth. The trickster shows you in a twinkling where the path to God might be and where it might lead. So deities depend on their tricksters, even as they are often irritated and exasperated by them. Every divinity requires a few tricks up its sleeve. I wonder if Charlie Todd and Improv Everywhere have their finger on some of what is often missing in all of our ponderous theory and serious systematics. And that is that we do need a trickster too who will overturn the tables, turn them over on us sometimes, mix it up, make us laugh, show us a truth that makes no sense at all, and might even be a little sacrilegious. When you realize that you aren't looking into a mirror dimly but are staring at a strobe light, it makes you think twice. In Christian theologies, the Holy Spirit can play the role of the trickster as a sort of wild card, but I really like the idea of Jesus as the trickster because he is in all forms and for reasons that are far deeper than Charlie Todd and Improv Everywhere are willing to claim for themselves. So this is evident, and I would like to now read um, John 8. And I've asked two people, is it going to work, Anna? Okay. We are going to hear it first in Swedish, because I've invited my friend Anna Stenund, who is, I want to tell you, the only person in Sweden with a PhD in homiletics. <laughs> and she is here. And I'm going to ask her to read it first in Swedish. And it's good for you to hear scripture in other languages. We should do this every, every worship experience. If you've been to Teze, you know how powerful that is. And then I've asked my old high school friend, Laura Fitzpatrick Nagler, who is now a student here at the Divinity School, to read it in English. So I'm going to invite you just to put the paper away. I know it's addictive to have it for the moment, but just listen.
Tidigt på morgonen var han tillbaka i templet. Allt folket samlades omkring honom och han satte sig ner och undervisade. De skriftlärda och fariseerna kom då dit med en kvinna som hade ertappats med äktenskapsbrott. De ställde henne framför honom och sa, mästare, den här kvinnan togs på bar gärning när hon begick äktenskapsbrott. I lagen föreskriver Mose att sådana kvinnor ska stenas. Vad säger du? Detta sa de för att sätta honom på prov och få något att anklaga honom för. Men Jesus böjde sig ner och ritade på marken med fingret. När de envisades med sin fråga såg han upp och sa Den av er som är fri från synd ska kasta första stenen. När de hörde hans svar gick de därifrån en efter en. De äldste först och han blev ensam kvar med kvinnan framför sig. Jesus såg upp och sa till henne Kvinna, var tog de vägen? Var det ingen som dömde dig? Hon svarade, nej herre. Jesus sa, inte heller jag dömer dig. Gå nu och synda inte mer. Thank you for not asking me to do this in Swedish. <laughs> Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And making her stand before all of them, they said to him, Teacher, This woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law of Moses, we are commanded to stone such women. Now what do you say? They said this to test him so that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And once again he bent down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the elders. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, sir. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on, do not sin again. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There are four verb sequences I want to highlight. The first is in the very first sentence. Early in the morning, Jesus came again to the temple. That's the verb, he came again. We're supposed to remember that he was there yesterday mixing it up with the temple security guards, creating scenes of no joy and lots of chaos, according to the Pharisees. Next day, he is back. But what I'm remembering is other stories about Jesus in that same temple in Jerusalem, two in particular. I'm remembering when he decided it was the perfect place to hang out for three days as a teenager. Even though his parents had no idea where he was and were searching frantically all over the city. 
This is the same temple where he went. It's the setting of Jesus' first lock-in. <laughs> and it is the place where adults, learned adults, first took him seriously. That's an unforgettable experience for a young person. When Jesus was 12 years old, he knew the temple to be a place where grown-ups don't just want to play with you or pat you on the head. They want to talk with you about things that matter. They want to talk with you and read scripture with you for hours. And it will be so wonderful and so absorbing that you're, you will lose all track of all time and even forget your mom and dad. I wonder about that. For Jesus, one memory the temple holds is that it is a scene of absolute joy. It's the place where you realize what you need to do in life, which is God's work. Didn't you know I had to be about my father's business? He said to his parents when they finally caught up with him. I like that, my father's business. The business of God that requires you and me and the reading of scripture. Otherwise, it's a family business that never gets off the ground. Another memory, memory of Jesus, that, uh, another memory of the temple that Jesus holds is a scene of chaos. He went in one day when he got to Jerusalem with his disciples and turned over every table and made a huge, awful mess. Our official word for that is that he cleansed the temple. And it happens in the other three gospels. Where are my New Testament scholars? Am I right? It doesn't happen in John. I kept looking. Am I right in that? At the very beginning, you see, this is why you gotta ask the group. Okay, um, so good, it happens in John 2. Thank God, I just missed it, it was late. I wonder then about what this memory says to him. The temple is a place that sometimes has to be cleaned up. My father's business does not include money changers. You don't need anyone to change whatever currency of life and love you bring to God. And this memory of the temple is in Jesus too. So there he is, back again. He's back. Came again to the temple. You gotta hand it to the man. He doesn't give up on the temple easily, which is good news for us. And here come the scribes and the Pharisees again. We know from the previous chapter in John that they're looking for a way to arrest him. So here's the second set of verbs I want to highlight, which belong to the Pharisees. They brought a woman caught in adultery. And making her stand before all of them, they said, teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. Look at that first verb, they brought her. Brought her. They didn't ask her to come, invite her politely, lead her, introduce her around. No, they brought her like she was on a leash. Some odd curiosity to show the crowd. And why could they bring her? Because they caught her like she was an animal in a trap. And it was a trap. And we know that because it says right there in the text over and over, they are looking for a way to catch him. And so what is awful here is that the trap they set for Jesus also caught a woman. Like fishing nets catch dolphins when what they're really trying to catch is tuna. And you know that's never good news for the dolphin. Collateral damage, isn't that what we call it? They brought a woman caught in adultery, which is then modified in the next verse to say, in the very act of adultery. As if that were possible, to be caught in the act of adultery all by yourself. <laughs> so where is the other party? And it makes you have to ask yourself, was the other one, who now is not here, was he part of the trap? You have to wonder, because no one seems bothered that he's not here. No one. Next set of verbs. The Pharisees made her stand before all of them. 
which tells you right away that this is a trial, but it's hard to see that it's about her and not Jesus. It's also hard to see how she'll ever get out of it once they bring in Moses. Moses commanded, they say, that we should stone such women. What do you say? Listen to that, not this woman, such women, adulterous women in general, in theory. Not this one right here, which tells me she isn't the subject, she's an object, she's circumstantial, she's the bait they need to set this trap. And bait gets eaten, that's the purpose, it's scrap meat. I notice they try to pull rank with Moses. Seriously bad move. <laughs> Moses commands us to stone such women, they say. Wait a minute, Moses commands? Moses doesn't command. Moses is the great liberator. That's his first role in the history of Israel and the mighty acts of God. He's also the giver of the law. But the law was written by the finger of God. God is the one who commands. That's God's verb. Moses is just the courier. He gives it to the people. So there's a triangulation happening here. Let's see if we can get to Jesus through Moses circa this woman. Since we caught her in adultery, which breaks the seventh commandment, we could have caught her in the eighth or ninth or tenth commandments. We could have set a coveting trap. This woman was caught in the very act of coveting. But that doesn't have the same shock appeal, you know? Stoning is so much more dramatic. And the law says we stone such women. Bad move again. Actually, actually, it says we stone them both, the man and the woman. Leviticus 20. It's a very sloppy bit of argumentation these Pharisees make. It is nothing like Tamar's rhetorical brilliance. Fourth verb sequence to notice. Jesus didn't answer them at all. He bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. Okay, run that through your biblical echo chamber. Where have we heard about writing with fingers before? Exodus, God writing commandments on stone tablets. The book of Daniel, the moving finger on the wall in the king's dream, which Daniel so helpfully interprets as a sign that the king is about to be deposed and demolished. Jesus wrote with his finger on the ground. We don't know what he wrote, but it's a great bit of theater. Now we all want to know. We're craning our necks. We're looking over his shoulder. We want to see while the woman continues to stand and the scribes continue to question. Now here's why it is so important to read scripture with your whole body. I'm going to ask, I love that this room is set up in circles. We don't have to even move chairs. I'm going to ask the first and the second rows to stand up right where they are. Um, I'm going to go like this so you can still hear me. Okay, what does it say? It said, <laughs> I'm not going to do that. I'm going to stand back here. I need a moving mic. It says, they brought the woman and made her stand in the midst of them. And who's there also, and who's right there in front of them? It's G. Michael, all right, Michael, 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 Michael. No one else is going to be able to bend down. All right. <laughs> writes with his finger on the ground. Okay, do it. Just bend down. All right? Way down. All right? Just start writing. What has he done? He, he's taken himself out of their eye level. He's not making eye contact. What do you do 
when you don't want to engage, those of you who have kids, you tell, you, your kid, you know, what he's done is he's bent down and while they say we should stone her, so who do they have to look at? One another and her, through her. And then it says he stood up and said, let the one among you who is without sin cast the first stone. And he bent down and wrote on the ground again. And then what does the text say? And one by one, beginning with the elders, <laughs> go on, do it, sit down. Beginning with the elders, well, all right, never mind, we didn't rehearse this. And Jesus looked up and saw the woman. I'm trying to remember it verbatim, help me if I don't get it. He straightened up and he said, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, she doesn't even get a verb. She says what? No. Nope. <laughs> no one, sir. And he says, well, neither do I. Neither do I condemn you. Go your way and do not sin again. He doesn't say adultery, just sin. Thanks, guys. Should I pass it? Thanks. I didn't see that until I actually blocked it with students one day. Here's what I want to say to you. I think Jesus comes again to the temple that day expecting a little repertory action. He knows what's up. He knows what the scribes and Pharisees are about, that they have it in for him. And he knows they're going to throw the book at him, the script in the scripture as they read it, as they spin it. And so he engages in a little bit of theatrical reversal with them, a little parody of their own law. But it's not just play. This is like the book of Esther. This is in deadly earnest. There's a real woman standing right here whose life is at stake. If Jesus plays it right, if he works the angles, if he splinters the mirror into strobe lights, maybe her life will be saved. But he doesn't know for sure that it's going to work. This is subjunctive, liminal, duplicitous, dangerous performance right here in the temple because it looks for all the world that the people here are totally willing to go through an execution to prove a point right here in the house of God. So Jesus mixes it up right back. Let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Cool, go. Sure, we can act the law out right here if that's what you want. Let's just add one spin to it, okay? Anyone who's without spin, sin can go first. As if the rest of us, the ones who are with sin, we'll wait, we'll take our turn, we'll wait for you to break the ice. Except that Jesus has also staged this, as we saw. He's taken himself out of the line of sight, the center of focus. He's bent down. He's writing whatever it is he's writing with his finger on the ground. He won't make eye contact. He won't stand up. And the men... I know you, there were women, but really it was men. Don't you think? Okay. And the men, the Pharisees have to stand there with this woman before them and their peers around them and they all, they, all they have to look at is her. Unless they want to look beyond her and look at one another, see themselves in one another's eyes. And now they are in a new script, one they never expected. Are you the one without sin? <laughs> no way. I have covered your backside so many times. I have been the crafty friend for you who helped to get you get what you want. You can't be the first one to throw a stone. You're not going to start this. What about him? He's even worse. Come on. No way. And on it goes, right in their heads until one by one they realize they can't stand up in front of one another and claim to have no sin. And stoning a woman who's right in front of you, is very different than talking about her and what you are theoretically allowed to do. The Repertory Church gathers to rehearse the biblical text. 
because we know that somewhere in this script is the flash of reversal that will open our eyes. We can't do it by ourselves. Something has to do it for us. So you know, while we're waiting, this, this is the place to come at any age, at any time, to read together, to make mischief with the text, to let it show us a world beyond fig leaves, a world where liberators always come before lawgivers, and sisters and brothers never tear one another apart, and God is always the subject. Otherwise, you know what? It's just a lot of drama. Everything we do here, it's just a lot of play acting. And why are we here? We know it isn't just drama. It's so much more. I want to close with the last verse of the hymn we sang on, on Wednesday. With its glorious text written by Washington Gladden, the great churchman and church reformer of the 19th and 20th century, leader in the social gospel movement, and, who knew, poet. I learned that he is the, was the first editor of the Pilgrim Hymnal. And this hymn, this hymn verse, is the verse the choir used to sing at the church I served in Minneapolis as a prayer of illumination every Sunday, right before the preacher preached. Let us pray. Light up thy word, the fettered page from killing bondage free. Light up our way, lead forth this age in love's large liberty. O oh, light of life, within us dwell, through us thy radiance pour, that word and life thy truths may tell, and praise thee evermore. Amen. Amen. Thank you.